stories, spirituality, pathways, and aliens. You're here on The Long Road Home. Immediately dive in, but um, so let's switch over. I'll start off with Mike Pinson. <clears throat> oh, to be a fly on Mike Pinson's head. <laughs> all the smells, the wonderful fly smells. The sights you will see. Yeah, I bet all politicians stink, though. Stink of something. Yeah, something smelly. Because they're full <laughs> of it. Oh, but full I'm of it. Uh... Shit, shit, shit. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Chad. And I'm Emily. Welcome to another episode of The Long Road Home. I uh, hope you guys have had a great week. A lot of stuff has happened. Uh, not here, though. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in our house. It's basically Groundhog Day all the time. Uh, time soup. The world never ends. It just happens over and over and over again. But we did get to go pumpkin picking yesterday. We did. Yeah, it couldn't have turned out nicer. We got some sweet pumpkins. We got some, uh, what, cider? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah got you got to get that apple cider. Got some rum. We, we did had, do that. We had a good time. We did do that, too. Last night was good. <laughs> and we got some beautiful pumpkins. Yeah, we did. It was really fun. We hope you guys have been enjoying October. Cannot believe it's almost halfway over already. I know. It goes by so fast. It's my favorite month, and it's just, like, yeah. gone. It's zipped by. It's been way too fast this year for me. I've only seen, like, not nearly enough scary movies at all. It's time to binge. It is. It's just, like, six a day. <laughs> so, Yeah. So we hope you were able to tune in last week to part one of the murder of Nancy Morgan. We're going to continue that story today, and next week we're going to have a part three. This story got huge really, really fast. We got in-depth as we could, and it's been really interesting, but we decided to split it into three parts. Yeah, it's it's a very involved story, and there's a lot of... Um Moving pieces. Yes, exactly. A lot of moving pieces. So we really want to give it uh, what it's due, yeah. and that's why we're making it three parts. Exactly. Not many people have covered this, we found out, surprisingly. I mean, I hadn't heard of it before we read the book. No, um, that's true, too. But it's not like people in the county are chomping at the bit to talk about this story. No, this is not a piece of history that people like to relive, I don't think. Until now. So. Let's do it. To pick up where we left off last episode, in the days leading up to the murder, Nancy spent an evening with Ed Walker. The two discussed the future of Vista and what they planned to do after the program was over. Ed helped turn her Plymouth around in the driveway before seeing her off for the final time on Sunday night. The next day, Richard Hames, who was in charge of the Madison County Vistas, began to worry. He had been unable to reach Nancy. He wanted to let her know that two new tires had arrived for the Plymouth, which was registered under his name. On Tuesday, he contacted Clarence Cutshaw to see if he had any contact with her. Clarence hadn't seen her either. After the call, Hames made the decision to contact the Sheriff's Department. I think it's interesting to note here that the Sheriff at the time, Roy Roberts, who we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail later, later claimed he had not been notified that the young woman was missing, so no official search actually was launched. Come on. Yeah, this is like bad from the beginning. Everything, yeah. everything that happens in this episode, you're going to be like beating your head against the wall because mm-hmm. of the actions that some of the the officials took while they were doing the investigation. Seriously, it, it's it's a very frustrating story. And looking through the book again, watching it happen, was really really hard because there were some glaring problems just immediately that should have been taken care of. Now word began to spread quickly in the Shelton Laurel and Sodom communities that Nancy appeared to be missing, and folk began to take action. Groups of both local people and the Vistas began to search county roads in teams. By Tuesday evening, worry had become fear. Nancy was expected at a meeting that night to plan a fundraiser for one of her projects, but never showed up. The number of volunteers in the search began to grow after that. Ellen Banks recalls, I wouldn't have gone walking up Hot Springs Mountain at night looking for most people. So there's this strange division throughout the book. Seems like there's a lot of people that don't really care what's happening to her and a lot of people that really did. There was either like a lot of love for Nancy or none at all. Just like total apathy. Yeah, a ton of it. So it's it's strange to see that and we'll see as the story continues that it seems like a lot of people were more concerned in protecting local people than they were about discovering what happened to Nancy. And my grandma, like a lot of other older folk in the county, have a really, really big fear of nighttime in the woods. Like I heard it all the time growing up. 
don't go out in the woods at night. Don't be out there at night. You better be back before sundown. I definitely thought you were exaggerating about it when we were first dating, but seeing it firsthand, it's it's different level of fear. It is than the average fear of the dark. It makes me wonder, like, what was going on? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, when they were growing up, it's really strange. But to see that generation of people out at night looking for someone like that does show that there was some love for her in the community. Didn't you have a, a relative? Um, that had a story of like when they were a kid, they were home alone at night and yeah, they just saw was, somebody, uh, <laughs> somebody like looking through their window. Yeah, that was my grandpa. So oh yeah, my gosh. Uh, him and his brother lived in this cabin in Laurel in a, in Spilcorn. And they were just like dicking around one night and they were goofing off inside the cabin. And one of them was like, what? They had a flashlight. And they were like, what if you shine that flashlight at the window and you saw someone? And they did. And there was a guy in smushed up in the corner, but like, where the chimney meets the house with his hands over his face. Ugh. And then their mom ran him off. With a broom, right? Yeah, with a, fu- with a broom. It's unreal. So that's what's going on. Yeah. Just, just saying. I mean, there, that was that was a few, that was probably. I mean, it was before this time period, yeah. but like still. Yeah. Very, like there's a reason that they didn't like going out at night. Oh, sorry. That one gave me goosebumps. <laughs> no. It does it every time. It's a creepy story. Anyway. On Tuesday, word had also reached Ed Walker that something might be wrong. He received several phone messages from Mr. Hames asking if he knew where Nancy was. His initial thought was a car wreck, and that night he joined in the search. Walker was joined by two other Vistas who drove over Hot Springs Mountain and back again, while one of the men held a flashlight out the window looking for any evidence of her car. They drove slowly across the mountain along the edge looking for any evidence of a possible accident that could have sent Nancy careening off the side of the mountain. The roadway was so steep and so narrow that they couldn't pull off or get out of the car and walk. Ultimately, the effort put in by the search teams wasn't enough to locate Nancy, and at 4 on Wednesday morning, the search was finished. The unofficial search was finished. There was never an official search. It doesn't blows my mind. Oh, it's crazy. Um, Hames contacted the VISTA supervisor from North Carolina, Jeffrey Hammer, to let him know that Nancy was missing. Hammer himself was not initially concerned. He knew that Nancy had made plans to leave for a 10-day vacation that would take her around the country. The trip included seeing old friends, an old boyfriend, and making a speech in West Virginia to young people like herself about what she had learned in the mountains. So he just thought that she had left on her vacation and didn't tell anybody. Well, yeah, he thought she was just gone and had just left. Just taken the the Plymouth with her? I guess so. I don't know. That that is a good point. I don't know why he wouldn't be concerned about the car. Really weird. Oh, well, I think think we get to that. Yeah, you might be right. Yeah. Um, So... Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Hammer did, however, view Nancy's apparent disappearance as a good opportunity to make a visit to the county. Unfazed by her disappearance, he viewed it as an opportunity to be supportive of the project, which appeared to be going well to him. He landed and except ser- for the Except for the missing person. Yeah. I mean, he just didn't think it was missing. Yeah. But he, everything else Everything is else has been swimmingly. Okay. Uh, he landed and searched the airport parking lot for Nancy's car fully expecting to solve the mystery right then and there. He never found it, though. Instead, he rented his own and drove to Hames' house in the community of Walnut. So right now, there's definitely, like, an undercurrent of, like, something really bad has happened. Right, right. Now he's starting to get it. Yeah, at least to, like, the lower level of the community. The, like like him, I think when he realized the car wasn't there, he was like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> this is not great. So days of searching provided absolutely no evidence of Nancy's whereabouts. Instead, she would be found simply by happenstance. On Wednesday morning, a man named Jimmy Lewis, a resident of Sodom, another area of the county, was driving from his home with a load of empty soda bottles from his family's store. And yes, you did hear that correctly. It It is called Sodom. Yeah, S-O-D-O-M. Mm-hmm. Just like uh, the old biblical place. Mm-hmm. Everyone turned to salt. Is that what happened in Sodom? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's right. I, <laughs> I don't, don't think remember. anything good happened. Oh, also... Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but like we collected cans when I was little, like trash bag fulls of cans and stuff, and we'd go redeem them just like this guy's doing. It was like kind of like a thing that people just did there with bottles and aluminum cans and stuff. So this is pretty normal for anyone that doesn't know why you'd be carrying bottles around. Jimmy was going to redeem his bottles in Hot Springs, which was six miles away, and shoot pool. It was nine in the morning, and as he descended the mountain, he had to take a piss. Lewis pulled his car onto an old unpaved logging road on his right in an area known as Tanyard Gap and drove up a small way to make sure no one would catch him pissing. He took a few steps off the road looking for a level spot. Once off the road, Lewis noticed something on what was once an old wagon trail. 
In a glade of poplar and oak trees, he saw a gray car parked in the sunlight. The wheels were sunk to the hubcaps in mud that the vehicle had come to rest in after knocking over several saplings. Its doors were closed, and the hood was pointed uphill to the west. At night, the road sometimes served as a lover's lane, so Lewis carefully walked up and peered through the closed windows because he didn't know what was in there. But through the window, he saw Nancy Morgan in the back seat, dead. Nancy's body was naked and hogtied from behind in a kneeling position. Photos taken later of the crime scene described it in further detail. Nancy's maroon shorts covered her face. The crotch had been ripped. Her knees were resting on the floor of the back seat. One buttock was on the edge of the seat directly behind the driver. Her body was laid sprawled across the seat on her right side facing up. Her head turned at an odd angle against the back cushion. So he freaked the fuck out immediately and he drove to the sheriff's house which was kind of near where he was it was two miles away but of course he wasn't there he was in the courthouse in marshall the county seat which was miles and miles away from there it was a very long drive on the old road that connected these two places the sheriff at the time was a man named roy roberts and we're going to learn a lot more about him later as well Roberts was actually very familiar with the area because he had owned property on both sides of the new highway until four months earlier when he had sold the 200-acre tract to the United States Forest Service for $35,000. It was now designated as part of the Pisgah National Forest and included a section of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, Jimmy was able to find Robert's brother at his house, and they were eventually able to reach him at the courthouse. When he heard the news, he immediately left and headed towards the scene. So now they're going to get into it. Now the police are going to get involved. Yes, now they understand something is, like, really wrong. And I guess this goes back to his claim that, like, no one ever told me what was happening. Gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> dubious. It's a dubious claim. But it's like, I don't know, at the same time, these places were very, like, there's no fucking cell phones. Landlines are spotty at best there, I would imagine. Like, who even has, like, you don't even know if they all had phones, you know? Yeah. It's a very rural area. Like, I've got a book that's, like, shows photos of Madison County. And there are pictures even from, like, the 60s and 70s of people using using oxen to pull sleds and, like, plow and stuff. So it's, there is a very good chance that, like, the message was never relayed to him. So I don't know. So Roberts is an interesting character in this story because of, he, because of how he came to be the sheriff. Better known for his hobbies of descenting skunks and hunting squirrels with a musket, Roberts won the position of sheriff due to the lingering animosity from a scandal involving the previous Democratic sheriff. Roberts was well-liked, taught Sunday school, and was thought of as a moral man. Tall, bald, and lean, he preferred a dress shirt and pants to uniform and wore a tie and jacket for court appearances. According to many, Roberts was never expected to win, much less investigate gruesome murder. Great. Again, off off to a great start. Yeah, sound familiar? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know I was going to get it. (laughs) Instead, he preferred checkers at the jailhouse to what this job truly entailed. Yeah, so he was a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy. He really did not want to be there. His chief deputy, Diedrich Brown, recalled, quote, he wasn't interested in sheriffing much. Yeah, (laughs) everyone knew it. They were just like, (laughs) why is this guy here? And this statement appears to be true. Reluctant to be involved in such a nasty crime, Roberts eventually ceded his role in the investigation to Brown. Sheriff Roberts would soon not be the only law officer heading to the scene of the crime. Almost immediately, the scene became a nightmare for law enforcement. Nancy was considered a federal employee and drove a United States government-owned vehicle. The area where the car was found was the responsibility of the Forest Service, an agency that rarely handled serious crimes. Typically, a murder in the county would be the sheriff's case, but frequently agents of the more highly trained North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation of investigation were called in. SBI agents Charlie Chambers and Harold Elliott were sent to the scene and the FBI themselves came to investigate. Whew, okay. <laughs> before I before I move on, that's a lot. It is. It's a, a lot. There's a lot happening. It immediately becomes a clusterfuck. Like no one is really sure who's going to be handling the case. Yeah. At least not initially. A lot of hands in the basket. So yeah, to speak. a lot. People, if you if you get to solve, like, solving a murder is a big deal, I think, to any law enforcement unit, right? So, like, if you can, if there's a chance that you're going to be the one that's going to do it, I think you probably want it. Well, yeah, you can kind of, like, prove the worth of your program, so to speak. Yeah, except for old Roy. He just wants to decent skunks, I guess. <laughs> oh, like, what? That's a very strange hobby. It is. I mean, I, 
I we know of one family in uh, North Carolina that has owned a pet skunk that was descented. So I guess it's a thing there. Oh no, it is. My my aunt had one. Wait, your aunt had one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, my aunt had one when she when I was like really little. I remember going to Georgia. This is like one of my like early little kid memories. Like it's like a dream state of like me with a skunk. Well, who's it? Okay, I'm I'm sorry. We can totally cut this, but it was Henry Zabrowski on the last stream who recently said that. He equated uh, being a child to just constantly tripping. Yeah. <laughs> that's like you entering the dream state. That's exactly what it reminded me of. Reminded me of. Okay, anyway. Yeah, it was a, what is it called? A, fu- a fugue. It was a fugue state. And I was <laughs> yeah. just holding a skunk. Oh, my God. It's all a dream. It doesn't matter. Now, we're going to see throughout the remainder of this series, it did not matter which of these agencies controlled the scene. The investigation that followed the death of Nancy Morgan was bumbled by almost anyone who touched it. In the book, Penske speaks about how a large number of investigators from several agencies wandering through the scene of a crime can increase the likelihood of cross-contamination, and that can actually become a tool for defense attorneys that are arguing to protect the accused, whoever they decide to charge with murder. Unfortunately, this was the case here, and the agencies descended upon the small town of Hot Springs to begin jockeying for their own primacy on the case. Um, And the FBI in particular play a strange role in this case. Um, They actually withdrew themselves from the investigation fairly quickly, but somehow stayed involved, um, moving in and out of the county to ask local questions as they pleased. Yeah, the way that they kind of came and went is very strange, but we'll find out more about why that happened later. The initial investigation by the agencies milling through the scene found several pieces of evidence. Nancy had been tied up with multi-strand blue and olive nylon cord and tied in such a way that if she tried to free herself or even straighten, she would have been choked. State medical examiner Dr. Paige Hudson said later, quote, there was so much tension in that rope that it would have strangled her. She still wore her earrings. A watch on her left wrist had stopped at 1230. The fingers of both hands were curled. A roadmap and two umbrellas sat on the floor nearby. Along with a pile of her clothes, which had been torn off, there were also other items in the car with Nancy, including a skillet, several books, her handbag, and a blood-stained piece of unidentified clothing. The car itself was wet from a recent rain, but the leaves underneath the wheel and body of the car were dry. The keys were dangling from the ignition. Now, although the scene was roped off, SBI agent Charlie Chambers recalled, quote, You had to have a stick to keep people away. People who had been involved in the search for Nancy, as well as residents who were curious or bored, surrounded the crime scene. In the South, death is not always as morbid as you think. No, it's not. Sometimes, yeah, this uh, people are into it. <laughs> I so mean, <laughs> they wrote what are we doing right now, so, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like ballads, mountain ballads, that's what they're about is like someone dying. People liked it way back when. Yeah, true crime has existed throughout The entirety of humanity. When all you're doing is making butter (laughs) and you find out someone got their arms cut off and like hung up in a tree, of course you're going to go see it. Yeah. I mean, morbid curiosity. Like, what would you do if you found out someone died just like across the street right now? Would you go look? Yeah. I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't. I would. Yeah. I would go look. (laughs) You got to. I would go look. I'm I'm a nosy neighbor. Let's be honest. We're just like very separated from death in America now, too. So. It's like when something like that does happen, it's a big deal. Blows your mind. Yeah. People want to see a dead body. You guys want to see a dead body? <laughs> it's from Stand By Me. The, the Stephen oh. King book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's from a movie and a book. I've only... Th- I don't need to say that. Okay. I've only seen bits and pieces of that movie. I've you don't like spooks. One That's okay. Or one, one go. I was laughing at the next line that you have written. <laughs> For many, it's an opportunity to reconnect with old friends. But it is. It totally (laughs) is. Like, people genuinely, like, when someone died when I was growing up, everyone came to the house, and they brought food, and they talked, and there was, like, more drama at the funeral and, like, the wake than there was in regular everyday life. Yeah. People like it. It's an event. (laughs) I brought my jam, my special jam for funerals. It's raspberry. What is that from? Uh, Nothing. Oh. (laughs) Nothing. That's just me talking. I'm really proud of myself, by the way, that uh, that I have not used my southern accent at all during the recording of these episodes, except for the memo quip. It's hard not to do the memo quip. No, but yeah, because um, I could. I could really do it. 
<laughs> do you want to like do you want to say you're not gonna do it or do you want to like leave it on the table no it's on the table okay it's on the table yeah okay noted so anyway back to nancy and the crime scene Nancy's audience included men and women of all ages, including the former sheriff of Madison County, E.Y. Ponder, and the Hot Springs police chief, Leroy Johnson. Sadly, Ed Walker also happened across the scene. He and his roommate were driving back to the community of Walnut from Bluff over Hot Springs Mountain. As they closed in on the scene with parked cars and police vehicles, Ed quickly understood what had happened. A friend of Ed's also at the scene told him Nancy's car had been found. After he was told the news, he sat with Richard Hames and wept. After Clarence Cutshaw was called to come and identify, I'm sorry. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because it's this the is a sad part of the story. I know, but K sounds are funny, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Clarence a lot Cutshaw that, called to come. It's a lot of that sentence, and I'm sorry. To collect? <laughs> no. To cut the re. Okay. After Clarence Cutshaw was called to come and identify Nancy, her body was removed from the scene and taken to Memorial Mission Hospital for her autopsy. Yep, so uh, we're going to find out later they didn't do much else at the crime scene for a long time. Uh, Yeah. yeah. It's only going to get worse. Okay. Dr. Paige Hudson, who we mentioned earlier, was called upon to perform the autopsy. I'd like to say this is like one of the most competent people in this story. I know. I feel like that they like kind of saw what was going on. Well, they were like very professional in how they handled it, and they were very like they just knew what was like they just knew what the fuck was up. They did a really good job with the autopsy. Is all I'm saying. Like this is the only part of the story that was done well, despite the circumstances. Yeah. So Hudson had been forced to perform the autopsy at Mission because his own facility, located on the campus of Chapel Hill, was just chock full of corpses. It's corpse season. So it was full. Yeah. So he couldn't use that. He couldn't do it there. And he thought that coming to Asheville would save some time. The case had begun to produce headlines in the state, which meant that there would be pressure to figure out what happened quickly. The autopsy was hurried. It was performed at 9 p.m. Wednesday night, leaving Hudson to rely on the fluorescent lights of the room, not the sunlight that typically streamed through the morgue south wall. Yeah, for some reason, they made note of that in the book, that they typically the room was brighter because of all the sunlight. And that's when they typically did the autopsies there because of that. Just obstacle after obstacle with this one. As the autopsy begins, we begin to see some of the same issues that will plague the investigation for its duration. The FBI agents attending the autopsy showed up late, and Hudson was also put off by the Bureau's performance, including handling of crucial evidence. He states, quote, None of the ties or ropes that I heard so much about that had been described to me over the telephone were present. As it turned out, they were in the automobile trunk of an FBI agent who showed up about halfway through the autopsy. This is not quite the way it's done even back in 1970. End quote. It's a very professional way of him to be like, these guys are fucking idiots. They're fucking up. Like right away. What were they doing? I don't understand. They were FBI agents too. That's that's to me is the weirdest part about this whole thing. It's like though, if they're... If you think law enforcement at the lower levels is done poorly, you would think the top levels are a little bit better, right? Right. This is the FBI. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I, I still don't fully understand how in, how they were so incompetent. Yeah. And he has, we, we have another pretty great quote from, from um, Dr. Hudson. He also described the FBI's participation as, quote, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse agents. That's supposed to have been the that's supposed to have been the nation's top flight law enforcement organization, and the agents involved didn't seem to know better than to remove the evidence, remove the ties that had been associated with the body, and presumably had been the cause of death. It just reminded me of dealing with some of the most inexperienced of law enforcement officers, which occasionally happened in North Carolina. By and large, they all seemed to know better than to remove potential evidence from the body at the site of the murder. Yeah, once End again, quote. <laughs> you'd really think that they would be on top of something like that. A lot of ap- There was a lot of apathy in this investigation. And a lot just, of carelessness. Yeah, very careless. Hudson, along with Dr. George Lacey, the hospital's senior pathologist, another doctor, two North Carolina SBI agents, and an investigator from Hudson's office oversaw the autopsy. So again, a lot of people are there. Hudson quickly identified the cause of death as strangulation. The death certificate read, quote, It is impossible to determine whether she had been strangled and then bound or whether she died after being trussed up, he wrote. Quote, this was a murder by party or parties unknown. 
Hudson was also able to determine that Nancy had been dead for at least 48 hours before the time of the autopsy, which put her death sometime before 9 on Monday night. Yeah, so less than 24 hours after leaving Ed Walker's house. Sperm was detected inside Nancy, and Hudson wrote that it could have been deposited no more than 24 hours before her death. The samples were transferred to glass slides, which were preserved in paraffin. A deep groove had been made in Nancy's neck that was about an inch and a half below her chin. There were abrasions on each elbow, which were consistent with her having been dragged. Her blood type was O, and a type A blood stain appeared on one piece of white cloth. Her stomach was pumped and contained a considerable amount of partly masticated food material. There was a large quantity of what appeared to have been salad greens and carrot fragments. Finally, Hudson found that the front of Nancy's blouse was not ripped as investigators at the scene believed, but instead was cut with a sharp instrument. Hudson, one of the most competent figures in our story, finished the autopsy in less than three hours. Yeah, so he was in and out, and he did his job really well. We know exactly what, how she died, and it's very clear that like, it gave, it, it gave the investigators a really good time frame and really narrowed down the potential list of people that they thought could be involved. Yeah, and the food, the food bits is interesting as well. Yeah, it is. And one thing that I'm curious about is that we never really hear about the unidentified white cloth again. Yeah. It sort of just like goes away after the, the autopsy. Interesting. I wonder, was that stored in Marshall? Was uh, it in Marshall that there was It the, was in Asheville. Excuse me. Okay, so was that, was that white cloth stored there? They could have been, um, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what happened to the evidence in our next episode, but you guys... You're not going to be happy. It's not going anywhere good. No. Nancy's murder very quickly began to be picked up by wire services and newspapers across North Carolina. Opinions of Nancy also began to flood in. The local Vista worker, Myrtle Ray, described Nancy as overfriendly. Mountain folks are suspicious of strangers, especially if they are too friendly. This, this type of fucking attitude makes me so furious because it's like, what do you want? They're either too friendly or they're not friendly enough. Like, what do these people want? It doesn't make any sense to me. They want you to get out. Yeah, just get out. Get out. Get out. It's all they want. They don't yeah. care if you're too nice or too friendly or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter to a lot of people. It's stupid. It's it, it, this. <laughs> this idea drives me insane. I don't understand it. And so so many people are like proud of that. I don't know. It's it's weird. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and say. You're going to hear some things if you're from this area that might bother you. Or maybe you already did. But just remember, most of them are actual quotes. And I'm from there, so I've seen some of these people. And I've seen the people that the news interviews. These were real thoughts by real people, and some of this shit still lingers around today like a bad odor. Whether you like it or not, the values of some mountain folk are about as sensible as drinking bleach to cure COVID. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. That's that's just my two cents. Coming. You know what grinds my Chad's gears? Coming. I'm coming hard and I'm coming fast. For you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> other people had higher opinions of Nancy. Glendora Cutshaw said that Nancy had the sweetest personality I've ever seen. Everybody here loved her. All the teenagers and adults here are saying that they would love to get a hold of the person that did it and do the same to them. She did also acknowledge that there was, without doubt, hostility toward the Vista workers in the county. The teenage boys there resented the male volunteers with their long hair, clothes different than the local fashion, i.e. what I'm assuming is blue jeans, uh, and the ability to be around the women in the program. This just goes back to like the whole idea of the outsider. Yeah. They're just different, and no one cares whether or not they're, they're nice or not. They're, they're not the same as them. Right, so there's resentment. Immediately revert back to tribalism. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what people had to say, the murder shook the county in a big way, sending a message about what the community there may be like to the outside world. In a front page article in the News and Observer, Carrie Grusin wrote that the county was one where disputes are sometimes settled with a bullet and electoral politics are sometimes as crooked as the roads. And the seemingly motiveless murder of an attractive young anti-poverty worker last week has brought fear among her fellow volunteers and even some locals given its gruesome nature. So what Carrie did, actually, to me, is kind of the exact same thing that a lot of other people did previously and described these people in a really negative light. Um, whatever happened, there were people in that county that were very good people, and I don't think what she did helped the people that were trying to solve Nancy's murder in any way. I'm sure someone saw this article and was immediately like, I don't want to be part of this anymore. 
And probably maybe even they might have even lost some sort of evidence or statement because of something like this. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. It is. Just the whole thing. The whole thing is unfortunate. The expectation of the, the Vista workers wanting to come in and help um, and, and the locals who in ways did need the help. Yeah. But just resisting, you know, the hand that was there to feed them. And there, there's just a wall. It was like there was a wall built between the whole them entire and, time. And they couldn't reach each other. Yeah. Um, a state trooper was also quoted in Grusin's article saying that the murder was out of character with the county. And usually it's a clean, straightforward knife or shooting. They get stomped or run over by an automobile. But in the 16 years I've been here, we've never had a strangulation. People here don't know that kind of killing. The fact that that state trooper hasn't ever seen that is telling to me. Because honestly, I don't know what happened. It's like, at reading it again, I thought I knew. But now I'm just like confused. There's so many different stories from different people. And now it's just like, I don't know what to believe. But, okay, so I understand it. Right, right. He says he's never seen that kind of killing there in 16 years. But to say that people didn't know how to strangle another person... Yeah, no, it's fucking. Yeah. I'm sorry. They don't. They didn't know how to how to choke a person. I just don't. I don't necessarily buy it. Yeah. I'm sure maybe those murders hadn't happened, but also people were living. People were really, getting strangled. People <laughs> were living really tucked away and far from one another. And like, yes, there was community, but it, the area was very um, like the people were scattered throughout the area. So you don't know. People people were getting strangled all the time. Just say everywhere. Somebody got strangled at some point <sighs> in Hot Springs, North Carolina, or that area, or that general mountain range prior to this happening. Right. It's not that unfathomable, right? No. No. Okay. No, I, okay. I, I, that statement. Well, I was always. I was just a little like. Yeah, okay. I know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Dude, they're not all angels. No, they're not. And I but, bet you they know how to choke. Somebody. Little country angels, corn cob pops, straw hats, <laughs> button nose. <laughs> But knows. As news continued to spread, the Vista workers began to hold meetings about what to do next. With good reason, many of the volunteers began to fear their neighbors. After the killing, Ed Walker never stayed alone in his house again out of sheer terror. Local communities also began to hold meetings, but for a different reason. A town gathering at the Walnut Community Center showed that the people there thought the murder would bring bad publicity to Madison County. Many believed the murder was an internal issue with the Vistas and that there was not local involvement. They believe the murder to be a new blight on the area through no cause of their own. Um, this is something you see not only in like this rural community, but in a lot of for, in a lot of murders. It's much easier to blame the victim for what happened rather than to accept that someone you may know did something terrible. Nobody wants to believe that their neighbor could do something as brutal as what happened to Nancy, and the people of Madison County use the fact that she was an outsider as a keystone for that belief. It's always easier to blame the victim for what happened to them. And it's, I don't understand. It's so fucking fun. <laughs> Get angry. I mean, yeah. I just watched that documentary like last week, uh, American Murder, The Family Next Door on Netflix, about Chris Watts. Uh, and this murder took place in 2018. And the same fucking thing happened where he tried to blame his wife for the the murder of his children so then he had to kill her right that that's the story and people fucking bought it and yeah. they held on to it and they ran with it for i think months if not a year before he finally admitted that he in fact had done it just there's some people out there shut. that will never believe that something like that could be done by someone they know there's websites like jody arias the woman who killed uh travis whatever his name was in utah there are still websites that justify what she, like, that still believe that she didn't do it. Some people just don't want to believe the truth. Travis Alexander, by the yes, way. Yes, Travis Alexander, another very creepy tale. But yeah, all that to say that you're right. It is, it, it is not exclusive to rural areas, and no. it is still happening today. It is. Shortly after these meetings, the Vista National Office decided to pull the remaining volunteers from Madison County. Each volunteer received a week's leave and a plane ticket home and were told to clear out as soon as possible. They had the option to either terminate their service or to try and find another project. Ed was one of the last to finally leave, and soon the three remaining volunteers and supervisor were gone from the county. The VISTA program never returned and was instead replaced by a program that used local volunteers. And honestly, I'm not certain who the blame could be placed on for the, the failed VISTA program. I think it came in with good intentions, but the people that were in charge just 
didn't get how resistant some of the locals would be to do anything different than what they weren't already used to. And uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they should have looked into a program that used more local people. Definitely, definitely. It's really hard to put put any blame on this because it was well intentioned. It just it just exploded in their face. Now, there's a couple of parts of the book we're not going to go deep into, and that includes the funeral that followed Nancy's death. Some of the Vistas were able to travel to Louisiana where her parents were to attend and uh, were able to talk with her father. I do think it's important to note that her father had already begun his own investigation into the murder before the funeral even started. Awesome. Yeah, he was, he was ready to figure out what happened. He met with the Vistas that were able to attend after the funeral and began to probe in a very dispassionate, professional way, as Pinsky put it. He wanted to know what happened the day before Nancy disappeared, where she had been and when, and if she had any enemies in the county. Apparently, according to Ed Walker, neither the sheriff nor the North Carolina SBI agents had asked them any of these questions since the murder had occurred. What is happening? I don't know. I don't understand it. Here's the thing. I'm conflicted right now because I love these stories of loved ones, uh, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, best friends that really um, spearhead and and push the investigation of their lost loved one, um, i.e. that documentary. Earl Moore. Yeah, oh yeah. That, that documentary that I watched recently, or here we have Earl. Um, I, I love that story. I mean, there's more, um, gosh, what is that story in Unsolved Mysteries where the body – the body is found by the family after oh, the search is yeah. over. Like I, those are powerful stories, and that those loved ones care so much that they that they're going to make it happen, or at least try their damnedest to bring their loved one to justice. But like, what the fuck that they have to do that? Yeah, the lack of like actual police law enforcement officers doing their job. The lack of it is unbelievable. Oh, in some after of those his cases. daughter's funeral, he is the first person to ask his friends. Ask her, excuse me, ask her friends yeah. what had happened. Yeah, according to Ed, it was. Um, ah! I'm surprised they weren't all rounded up immediately. 100%. Everybody. You know, there, oh, was there an investigation? Like, well, we'll get into that in a second. Um, Colonel Earl Morgan, Nancy's father, explained to a reporter later, I cannot escape the thought that it may turn out to be some bitter, twisted product of the very kind of environment Nancy was trying to help eliminate. Days after... This meeting with Colonel Morgan, two FBI agents met with Earl and Nancy's older brother, George. They were given further details of what happened to Nancy and described what they planned to do to capture the responsible party. Those agents, however, had no idea of the absolute clusterfuck that was about to happen to the investigation in Madison County. Oddly enough, after speaking with Earl and George, the FBI effectively withdrew from the case without any explanation, possibly as soon as a day after Nancy's funeral. Cool. They just left. Um, their absence put the unwilling Sheriff Roy Roberts in charge, along with agents from the SBI. This is something I didn't know. Most states did not have an SBI until the 50s or 60s. North Carolina's was actually one of the earliest, founded in 1937. Uh, SBI is trained by the FBI, but some of the instructors frequently disparage them as arrogant, quote-unquote, junior G-men. I guess the FBI doesn't like them. I don't know. Very quickly, however, Charles Dunn, head of the SBI, realized that the investigation was beyond the capabilities and resources of the state. There were a lot of other people that also held this belief. Richard P. Doyle, the assistant general counsel for the Office of Economic Opportunity, began pleading with the Justice Department to become involved with the case within two days of Nancy's body being discovered. For some reason that I'm not entirely certain of, and it's not really covered in the book, the local United States attorney in Asheville, Keith Snyder, urged the Justice Department to reject these arguments. Um, he said that a lot, from what I gathered, he just basically was like, what Doyle is saying does not amount to uh, you guys becoming involved. I'm not sure why he did it. but Yeah, what was the um, motivation there? But it's like, weirdly enough, though, Doyle kind of agreed with him eventually in a letter that he wrote to him and was like, I don't really have enough evidence for this. I don't know why he did that either. It doesn't make sense. Just a bunch of knuckleheads. <laughs> but because of that lack of evidence, the assistant United States Attorney, Attorney General for Civil Rights uh, agreed with Keith Snyder and wouldn't allow it. So Earl Morgan at this point it just takes the fucking reins. He had a large distrust of the abilities of North Carolina law enforcement, and he worked himself to ensure that the resources necessary to investigate the murder would be available. Morgan had attended law school at LSU with United States Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, 
And after his daughter's death, he sent Long a telegram asking him to help obtain full FBI participation at ground level with the investigation. His efforts would prove successful, and soon the FBI agents were moved back into Madison County to interview anyone that was involved with the case. J. Edgar Hoover himself ordered copies of all field reports sent to him as they came in. Although the FBI was technically in charge now, different organizations involved in the murder continued to tussle. Um, the FBI did not like the Office of Economic Opportunity. They were considered a liberal holdover from the last presidential uh, term. Gotcha. Yeah, and the FBI is a lot more conservative than that, and they really didn't want to give them any information. They didn't trust them with it. Teamwork. This is... Through all the true crime and stuff that we've listened to, the way that a lot of law offices just don't pass information to one another is mind-blowing to me. And it's like it makes things so much harder. I don't understand. Right. So I've said that so many times, but it's true. Like It hurts my brain to try and figure out why these things are happening. Just let people help solve it. I mean, I guess if you think about it earlier, right, there were too many people involved in the case. And so then there was a mishandling of evidence and, and, and whatnot. But, okay, front end of the investigation has taken place. You've collected the evidence. You've performed the autopsy. Now can you ha- let people help? Like, wouldn't wouldn't it from there then on be a little bit easier to kind of open the door and say, like, I mean, you wouldn't think- you want multiple professionals involved to help bring this woman to justice? Or is everybody just trying to win? And that's kind of what it seemed like here. Ugh. Yeah. I don't know. Regardless, Earl Morgan had some big dick energy. Yeah. He, he really came in and jammed the FBI back in there. He wanted them there, and he was able to make it happen when everyone else just seemed to stop. So good on you, Earl Morgan. So because of all this distrust, the investigation continued to suffer. But through the investigation, we began to learn there was a side of Nancy that no one was truly aware of. And this is where things actually... So like at this point, you start to begin to think like maybe it was someone in the county, right? Suddenly, you you discover there's a couple of things about Nancy that could lead you to believe that maybe it was someone that she knew, or maybe it was someone that she knew in the county, and maybe it wasn't just a random person. Right. Um, and it really muddles what I what, the what picture I thought that you had. Yeah, right. exactly. Like it muddled the picture that I had of what might have happened to her. So discoveries began to be made to some that were uncharacteristic of Nancy. The Cutshaws found Kentucky bourbon and moonshine in Nancy's spice rack. And enough beer cans under her bed to fill several trash bags. I okay, mean, so the girl liked to... She likes to drink liked, a lot, apparently. Now, or she was just disgusting. <laughs> like, or, it's one or the other. I mean, how often were they visiting her? Did she have someone else staying with her? I don't know. That's what I saw. That's what I thought when I saw the like the trash bags full of beer cans. Like, there's no way. I mean, there is a way, but is yeah. this young woman? Really I don't know doing how it? close she Did was. Did she collect it over the course of a year because she was embarrassed that she was drinking and people and, there don't drink? See that that to me could be one of the reasons why they were there because Ed hid a lot of alcohol as well. Or when he did have alcohol, he made sure no one uh, saw him drinking. Right. Like the whole thing was like, don't drink with the locals, yeah. right? So maybe she, you know, she still wanted to have a good time. But she knew if she took her beer cans to the local to hot springs to get to be, get, get her ten cent, right? Like then they they might be talking about her drinking beer, you know. So maybe yeah. maybe that was it. Anyway, mm-hmm. Clarence took them to the dump before the FBI agents could find them. Another thing, not it's good, just you like guys. misstep after misstep after misstep by people who wanted to help, people didn't want to help. It just why there could have been fingerprints on the beer cans. One of the paperback books that had been discovered in her car turned out to be titled Sexual Deviance. Mm. Now, again, this is interesting. Um, We know that they didn't fingerprint the car. Did they fingerprint the books? No clue. Was this It's never book? mentioned. It's never mentioned. Um, I just find it interesting that she would be carrying that around with her. Ugh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We'll just continue. Because for some reason, under her pillow was a book about breast development yeah that was very odd to me i don't know i don't know what i don't know what was going on i just don't know what's going on no this i understand what you're i i totally agree with what you're saying about like it starts to get muddy yeah very much but she was murdered oh yeah (laughs) i mean she she was was murdered by no means am i saying like it's her fault like she just the circumstances just might have been different than we things become vague to me it might not have just been random it could have been yeah Ugh, I don't know. It gets very Twin Peaks here. Yeah. And although Nancy had lived there for quite some time, Glendora was only able to find one pair of underwear and one bra in Nancy's cabin. 
another just really weird circumstance. Now, did, was it packed up? She was getting ready to leave, right? She was, but I really don't. I think her suitcase would have been there. So then that theory would be what? That she's was living somewhere else or like staying Something with someone else? Something was going on. I don't know. Okay. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know. No clue. It also came to light that the professor that Nancy had been involved with in college got her pregnant and she had had an abortion. Now, this doesn't fly in the South today. It definitely didn't fly in the 70s. No, definitely not. But, I mean, this came this came to light during the investigation, so I don't yeah. think that that has anything to do with... Well, no, it didn't, actually. That's not true. Uh, it came out before she was killed. Uh, so I don't know how it happened, but in the book, at some point, it was communicated to somebody, and then it got passed around, and then suddenly a lot of people did know about what happened Fuck, to her. dude. Nasty. That's yeah. just nasty. Yeah, people are fucking dumb. Just mean. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And say that the people that had a problem with that, I could hold up a picture of a fish embryo and a human embryo in the early development stages, and they couldn't tell me which one was which. You're just... I'm hot, man. You're throwing punches left and right today. You're in... They're hitting. It just becomes, like, a very, (laughs) to me, a dark story about, like, piousness. There's a lot of piousness involved in the way that Nancy was treated after her death. People had a weird view of her, and it's like, if she's not doing anything that's hurting someone, or if anyone's doing anything that's not hurting someone, just leave them alone. Like, it's none of your business. Can we all, like, can we all just, you know, try to give each other the benefit of the, of the doubt and say, like, we're all doing our best? Con- I'm, we're miserable all the we're time. We're all doing our best. It's just almost, leave each other alone. <laughs> okay. Leave her alone. Okay, just leave her alone. She was just young and trying to have fun and help people and too friendly my ass. Yeah, too friendly. Nancy had also, at some point during her time there, gone out with a a man in the area who she later learned was married. This type of information gave people the ammunition they needed to place blame upon the victim instead of the perpetrator. Nancy's fun-loving, flirty, and naive nature interactions with the community simply didn't mesh with the belief system of the area she was in. Nancy simply did not understand cultural implications that came along with being a young woman living alone in the mountains of North Carolina during the 1960s. It goes without saying that Ed Walker quickly became a suspect. State and federal investigators conducted a series of interviews with Walker at his home in Bluff and at the Madison County Courthouse. Walker insisted that he and Nancy enjoyed a friendly, casual relationship. They had met during basic training in Atlanta and had actually gone on one double date in Asheville, which ended in a kiss. Walker insisted, however, to the agents that he and Nancy had never had sex and recounted the last evening he spent with Nancy at his house before she disappeared. After the Vista's home leaves, they each voluntarily traveled to Asheville to take SBI polygraph tests. Walker's test became increasingly adversarial. In the first test, the examiner... (laughs) This is... This is just like straight out of something straight out of a movie scene. Yeah. In the first test, the examiner grabbed a pack of cigarettes from Walker's shirt pocket and told him the results indicated that he had killed Nancy. Walker demanded to see the results himself, but was refused. He also demanded to take the test again, which he did, but then he refused to take a third test. So odd. So like my theory is, is like either... (laughs) This, this, and this is changing. This is a constantly evolving theory. Okay. Either he did it, or right now he's in the room and he knows that they're trying to set him up. That's what I think. I, I mean, mean, like, th- imagine. Think, like, Well, uh, he was already very, like, uh, he was, I don't think he trusted the law. I don't think he trusted law enforcement. A lot of people in this story do not trust these people. There's just, um, there's no trust. It just seems from the get-go <laughs> They went for, it's like Occam's razor. The simplest answer is the right answer. And I think local law enforcement couldn't get past that. And they, they were convinced that he had did it from the get-go, I think. And they were, they were. Well, and nobody in Madison County even knew what strangulation no, was. No, we've never heard of, what's a str- strangle, oh. a str, a str, a str, what's ah, a. Just hit him over the head. Yeah, we'll just stab him. <laughs> Sorry, that, I don't know why that one just irks me so much. Um. If you are adhering to the theory that at this point in time, they are trying to set Ed Walker up, they are trying to set Ed Walker up, it just gives this this scene an interesting tone. Yeah, it does. (laughs) He's like, no, and grabs a cigarette out of his pocket, lights it, pulls and (laughs) takes a a big drag from it. (sighs) 
you going to admit to it? Because we know you did it. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Just but, like. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, are you kidding me, sir? That's kind of what, why I would think he refused to take a third test if he didn't do it. I think at that point he was like, this is so ridiculous. I don't have to. I was like, I've taken it twice. I voluntarily did it a second time. Why are they making me do this again? I'm not doing it. But but according to FBI files, Walker's test showed, quote, textbook signs of deception. These are the same FBI agents that left the rope in the car. That's though. true. So, you know, what do they know at this point? Oof, that's true. <laughs> Walker was continually hounded by state and local police as well, who had developed their own theory that involved a different version of what had happened at Ed Walker's home. Yeah, they looked through that sexual deviance book and they just made it up. This is thing. <laughs> it just made up a story. Yeah, this is where things begin to get really fucked up. I mean, they've already been fucked up. This, this whole is flat story out outrageous. Really so what they what they come up with and what they're like, this is what happened. So their story included a raunchy party fueled by alcohol involving rough group sex that ended fatally for Nancy. Who? Oh my god! They really said this. Yeah, this is what I'm they sorry. said. This is real. This is what they they claimed. I read this already, and it makes me angry every time. Yeah. Um, should I say that all over again? Yeah, you go for it. Their story included a raunchy party fueled by alcohol involving rough group sex that ended fatally for Nancy, who died during sexual climax. I'm, and I'm saying this. This was their theory. That was a theory that they came up with. So she was a part of an act where she was a willing participant and died via strangulation during sexual climax. What a way a, to go. At a fucking orgy in the holler. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, projecting much. <laughs> <laughs> there was another theory that suggested Ed and one other man had strangled her accidentally while they were fighting? Yeah, I don't know. Uh-huh. They're literally pulling these out of their ass. Both of these theories included Richard Hames. Which I don't understand. They like, just threw they him just, in there. They he literally, was the leader of the Vista, so they just threw him in, into these theories. It's like a toddler shoving pieces into one of those block puzzles. That's what yeah. this is. It's unbelievable. I, this is like, the fact that they just randomly threw him in there, I don't understand why. Right. So so both, of, both understand. of these theories <laughs> included Richard Hames um, and and. and the, that the two drove the vehicle to Tanyard Gap. Sorry, Tan- Tanger? Tanyard. Tanyard, okay. The two drove the vehicle to Tanyard Gap where the body was discovered and drove home. Yeah. So they thought, yeah, those were the those are the things that they came up with. <laughs> Just like completely unfounded. Just like literally throwing darts at a wall. Yeah. Like they had one of those big webs like you see. <laughs> like you see in the movies, like on True Detective, or, right, or yeah. one of those things, and they just put up a bunch of pictures and strings, and then they like wrote sort of like, random <laughs> words. <laughs> yeah, they had those those words. <laughs> they just stuck those tags wherever they wanted. Word magnets that you have on a fridge. They yeah. just like threw them, and then they picked Orgy. a few. Or <laughs> I don't know what magnets they have in this <laughs> in this story, but yeah. that's what happened. It was just a bunch of random words thrown at a board, and then they had a theory. Mm-hmm. So. Local police appeared to be convinced that whatever happened to Nancy, she had been a willing participant. They insist that investigators had learned from some of Nancy's friends that for several months she had been experimenting with being whipped and tied up when she had sex to to stimulate herself. What does that even mean? Oh, to like to have like more exciting sex? Is that what you yeah, mean? Like stimulating her sexual relations? That's just a weird way of saying it. That's what that. Pinsky said. I don't think he was like big into that. BDSM, <laughs> okay. so take it for what it's worth. Um, they insist that investigators had learned from some of Nancy's friends that for several months she had been experimenting with being whipped and tied up when she had sex, i.e. BDSM. Later, however, none of her friends would confirm that they had told the police this. Yeah, we don't know. So, Once again... Yeah, who, who who's at this? Who who's friends. at this? They're friends. They know they you those people. She goes can't be to found. another school. Uh, she lives in Canada. Yeah. Okay. We talk online all night. <laughs> uh, but for real, I don't know what they. It's hard to say though. Like, did they do it? Did they not? Smells like what, a fucking cover up to me. I just don't understand why they wouldn't admit to saying that later on. Why her friends wouldn't? Yeah. So well. Either they didn't say it or they're like ashamed that they would say that about their friend. But I think that if you say it once, you're probably not going to be ashamed to say it again. That's what I was thinking. So Richard Dillingham, a local who was building an outdoor church amphitheater nearby at the time Nancy's body was found, stated that Nancy had, quote, 
instigated it and caused it herself. They're saying that surely outsiders did this horrible deed. If it were an outsider who committed that crime, they would be hunted down and prosecuted. But if it were local folks that were responsible for that, then it possibly should be ignored. Just possibly be ignored. I'm going to use the, the mountain boys for like the real dipshits in this story. This guy's Sorry, little statement. Sorry, I'm cursing a lot. I'm, this is escalated. Well, this is like it's totally like different. In... The first episode was like a lot of build up and, and information, but this one is just like, it's just poor police work, groups of people that don't seem to really care. It was really, really hard to not destroy something while I was doing this research. God, her poor family. Yeah, I couldn't imagine being their parents and listening to people like this stupid fuck say anything at all. Why is this guy even allowed to open his mouth? These people vote. That's why you need to be voting in like three weeks. Vote. Get out the vote. The moral of this story is vote. This just goes back, though, to believing that no one that you know could do this. Yeah, I mean, look at Ted Bundy. He worked at a suicide hotline. Yeah, he was such a nice fella. So quiet. Never bothered no one. Yeah, freaking Ann Rule worked beside him, and she was going to set him up with her daughter. So... It's not always clear what the people directly in front of you are capable of. No, but the fact that this guy's saying like, well, if it's someone I knew did it, maybe we should just forget about it. Just leave it. Yeah, (laughs) that's some deliverance level shit right there. Yeah, it's not not looking great. No ideal. Once again, it's a beautiful place. Some good people. But uh, this really made, this this was a rough story, and it really made me angry. Even though locals wanted to believe or ignore that someone from the county could have done this, local suspects also turned up. A man identified only as Mike. Sorry, I need to say that over again because okay. it's Mike probably because he just... He gave yeah, the SBI him. won't release his right, last right, right. name or they didn't. A man identified as Mike, a Vista worker who, who struck up a relationship with Nancy, heard about her death and contacted the FBI. He claimed that on May 17th, he had driven to Madison County to visit her. They had had lunch and drove around the countryside sightseeing and taking pictures. Around 8.15 that evening, as they returned to Shelton Laurel, they realized they were being followed by a 1957 or 58 Ford sedan. The two cars pulled into the space between Cutshaw's Grocery and Nancy's cabin. One of them, who Nancy recognized, called Ben, spoke to her in what seemed to be an antagonistic manner. He asked, quote, Who are you shacking up with? He also pointed to Mike and asked, quote, When's he going to get a haircut? Do you want a drink? End quote. Okay. Yeah. Seems like so, a great person. Yeah. So this encounter frightened Mike. But apparently Nancy answered the man's questions calmly and eventually the men left. Mike said, quote, I was very frightened. And when I left, I was afraid those individuals might try to run me off the road or do me some physical harm. So yeah, this is like the first big lead that they're given in the case with through no actual effort on their part. He just shows up. <laughs> right. They he hears about it. Yeah. And then he shows up and he gives them this little missing piece. Yeah. So there were other leads, but it is unclear how many of them were pursued by the SBI or the FBI. It was the opinion of J. Edgar Hoover that the FBI had not done enough. On July 14th, a memo from the FBI director circulated throughout the Bureau. They were told to take fingerprints from Nancy's car to identify them and to interview those to to whom they belong. So it has been weeks since the car was found, but they had yet to take fingerprints. A month and a half. Just another giant bumble. They didn't take fingerprints off the car until a month and a half later. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Okay. (laughs) Paul Blart Mall Cop could have done a better job than these idiots at this point. They were also told to interview Nancy's former roommate so she could recall the story of the two men that came to the cabin drunk that we spoke about in the previous episode. And also to further investigate several other incidences that occurred involving Nancy. In one final burn, the FBI director had added things asked for in this memo were certainly elemental to any limited investigation. As law enforcement continued to bumble their way through this investigation, leads ran dry and frustration continued to mount. Suspects, information, and clues began to dry up in the county along with any outside information the FBI was attempting to garner. In March of 1971, nine months after the murder, the FBI agent in charge of the investigation sent a letter to J. Edgar Hoover and copied in the state SBI agent Charles Dunn. As far as the FBI was concerned, the investigation was closed. Shortly after that, the SBI, who had at this time conducted anywhere from 150 to 200 interviews, reduced the number of agents working on that case from four to two. 
Due to the impact of the case on himself and the county, among other things, Sheriff Roy Roberts announced he would not run for re-election in November of that year and resigned before his term was up, leaving power to Diedrich Brown, his young chief deputy. After his resignation, there would be no further formal investigation into the case of Nancy Morgan for over a decade. The ex-sheriff, E.Y. Ponder, a man notorious for favoritism and helping out those who would ensure his group remained strong on the county, would be elected twice before any more developments. In 1984, allegations by a shady man named Johnny Waldrop would once again have Ed Walker in the spotlight and produce a court trial that would reshape the politics of Madison County. And that's where we're going to pick up and conclude the story on part three of the murder of Nancy Morgan. Phew! Yeah. What a mess. It's so frustrating. And I feel like we've made no progress so far. Absolutely none. I'm sorry, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Just wasted an hour of your time. a lot of details. There's it's a, a lot, lot going on, just the, but literally, it's been a month and a half, and we just got freaking fingerprints. It's been an absolute nightmare for everyone involved at this point, and there was... Well, and now it's about to be 10 years before we pick back up. Like, yeah, I mean, it was just... And that's the, really the worst part, is like, all this happened, and then nothing came of it at all. It's really, really hard to just like try and put this story together without ripping my hair out. And in the next episode, we're going to learn more about E.Y. Ponder and how he ended up really wanting Ed Walker to be the person that killed Nancy. Yeah. Uh, And we're going to learn about some more shady characters. The trial that followed is really strange. It's a mess. It is. uh, And we're going to try and finish it up as best we can. We thank you guys so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed it. We hope you'll tune in next week for the conclusion. And yeah, thanks for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. In the meantime, please be sure to check us out uh, on Instagram at the underscore LRH underscore pod. You can find us at Twitter at that same handle. Again, the underscore LRH underscore pod. You can also reach us uh, via email. We would love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms. Stories. Stories. Yeah. Praise? Yes, please. (laughs) I like praise. We do Um, You can reach us at Gmail at... The LRH show at gmail.com uh, and check us out on Patreon as well. Yeah, we just got Patreon up and running. We hope you'll join us there. We've got a lot of additional content that we're going to put on there. Post Exclusive pictures. content. Exclusive merch as well. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be good. So yeah, check us out on Patreon at The LRH Podcast. And you can also find us on Facebook at The LRH Pod. Is that all the things? It's all the things. There's a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot and we keep missing check, them. Check, 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 check. Check, check, check. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. So also, you guys, if you're listening on Apple, please give us a rating and give us a review. Those things are going to be crucial. The algorithm will like us. We'll make it to the new podcast, and we can dive into the brains of people and children everywhere. Keep on moving us up the pipe. Yeah. Please. We really appreciate your support and all the love that you've given us. It's been absolutely amazing. We're almost 10 episodes in now. We've got a bunch more on the way, and we really are glad that you're here. So join us next time on The The Long Long Road Road Home. Home. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Smell you later. Alligator.